unemployment, bankruptcy, homelessness, a global economic crisis. Should we be optimistic or pessimistic about our global economic recovery? Exploring the impact and seeking solutions, United Nations University presents UNU Conversations, The Economic Crisis. Welcome to this edition of the UNU Conversation Series on the Economic Crisis, organized in connection with the June 2009 UN Conference on the World Financial and Economic Crisis and its Impact on Development. I am Jean-Marc Quaco from the United Nations University. With us here today, we have Professor Noam Chomsky. Professor Chomsky is an Institute Professor and Professor Emeritus of Linguistics and Philosophy at MIT and one of the most well-known public intellectuals in America, if not in the world. So Professor Chomsky is here with us today to talk about uh, the legitimacy of the, financial, uh, of the financial system. Professor Chomsky, thank you for really Good taking the time to be here today. And perhaps as a way to start our conversation, you know, very simply, what is your take uh, on, on the current financial uh, and economic crisis? First of all, there's, there's quite a few of them, mm -hmm. and they're interrelated. Uh, just to illustrate, in the short term, uh, the most dire crisis is the food crisis. Mm -hmm. There's uh, a billion people uh, facing severe malnutrition, maybe starvation. And uh, just today, in fact, the uh, uh, United Nations uh, World Food Program announced that it's going to have to cut back severely on food aid and uh, operations in places like uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and elsewhere uh, because of the fiscal crisis. Mm -hmm which has cut back uh, the pledges of the donor countries. Uh, it's cutting back, they say, maybe 20, 25 percent. And, uh, that's, uh, and that's right at a time when food prices are increasing again. Uh, uh, remittances are declining, uh, unemployment's going up, so it's kind of like a perfect storm. And here's a perfect illustration of how the crises interweave. The uh, financial crisis is the one that's uh, there is a, a much more severe crisis in the slightly longer term. It's the environmental crisis, mm -hmm. which is also closely related to these. Uh, the, uh, and that's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, a group of uh, MIT researchers, my, my university, just came out with a, uh, what they say is the most comprehensive modeling of the environmental crisis that's ever been done. And their conclusions are shattering. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's pro probably you know, maybe twice as bad as uh, what was even predicted in the Stern report, which is kind of the gold mm -hmm. standard. And so if we don't do something very quickly, there's not going to be any other crisis to mm -hmm. talk about. And that uh, crisis is related to uh, state corporate policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it didn't just come from nowhere. Uh, the, uh, all, you know, most of the pollution is, of course, from the industrial countries. The United States is far in the lead. And uh, China is more, but about 40 percent of Chinese mm -hmm. pollution is export to the West, uh, often from foreign-owned enterprises. Uh, and uh, in the 1950s, particularly, the uh, state corporate interests, uh, particularly in the U.S., just designed, uh, and the word design is correct, it's very well planned, a, uh, uh, a, 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 a social economic system that's based on intense use of fossil fuels, uh, destroying mass transportation, rail efficient railway systems, uh, 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 orienting uh, transportation and, and freight and so on to cars, uh, buses, airplanes, uh, suburbanizing the country, which was a huge social engineering project. Uh, all of this has left a situation where, you know, tinker dealing with the crisis is not simply a matter of uh, cap and trade or, uh, you know, uh, technological yeah. innovations are certainly critical, but there's also going to have to be a substantial social change. So, so basically you are saying that in fact uh, this economic crisis is only one of the many crises. Mm -hmm. And they all interact. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and, and in a way, shouldn't we say that somehow they, they put in question the very functioning of, of capitalism, of the economic model, which has been our models for for decades. 
or is it, is it yeah, not correct to say this? I don't, I mean, I agree that it's the functioning of our model, but it's not a capitalist model. Yeah. It should be called a state capitalist model. I, 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 I mean, saw this in your reading. What do you yeah. mean exactly by state well, capitalism? You know, the, the advanced economy relies very heavily on the state sector. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look through economic history, the, the developed countries, currently rich countries, first England, then US, uh, then the rest, uh, always had a very powerful state that intervened dramatically in the market to the benefit of uh, the, yeah. you know, the, the uh, merchants, manufacturers, mm -hmm. industrialists, and so on. So, for example, during its huge growth period in the 19th century, the, the U.S. had far and away the highest uh, uh, tariffs in the world, mm -hmm. and it, in fact, remained that way until the mid-20th century, when uh, the U.S. had s was so much in advance of every other country that it was willing to tolerate mm -hmm. uh, a market exchanges in which it would yeah. win. But um, that stops too. So when the U.S. started, uh, manufacturing started falling behind Japan, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, practically doubled protectionist yes. barriers. And that's only the, the little piece of it. I mean, that's a piece that economists often study. But if you look at uh, the modern economy is based very extensively on state organized and directed R&D, uh, subsidy, uh, procurement, uh, bailout, uh, the information technology mm -hmm. re revolution is an yeah. example, uh, computers and the internet, uh, biotechnology, uh, it always has a s substantial state component, uh, huge in fact. And, and the fact that we, t we overlook this state capitalism dimension, I I it's what you call presently one of the mythologies. Of it's modern kind of times, it's part so of mythology, and it's kind of interesting to see it now. There's a lot of uh, wailing about how uh, the government is intervening in the f financial yes. industry. What has it done all along? Yes, I mean, but, but precisely, I mean, what do we gain in creating such a mythology? Why do we want to overlook the importance, the centrality of the state, well, especially in the American context? There's good propaganda reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, the doctrinal system is mostly business-run, mm -hmm. public relations system, and so on. And they want people to oppose state intervention for the benefit of the public. Mm -hmm. So they would like to have benefits cut, for example. Uh, and they don't want uh, the state to interfere with managerial prerogatives, you know, compensation, for example, right now. But they're very happy to let the, the public basically be a cash cow. Mm -hmm. uh, they just want that part concealed. Mm -hmm. uh, so the picture that comes out is that we have uh, a system of uh, you know, entrepreneurial initiative, uh, consumer choice, and so on. I, I remember about 10 years ago, I read a speech by Alan Greenspan to the newspaper publishers extolling the magnificence of our uh, free enterprise system. Uh, I, I, he did something that most people don't do who talk about this. He gave examples. Mm -hmm. Every example that he gave was a textbook example of research and development and procurement uh, inside the state sector, mm -hmm. uh, which often for a long period, I and mean, computers and the internet were pretty much in the state sector for decades before you could make profit out of them. But it's kind of, you know, it escapes people's minds. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, others are not, I mean, sometimes it's almost comical. Like if you look at the World Trade Organization, uh, there are constant uh, legal battles going on between Europe and the United States over uh, uh, civilian aircraft production. There's actually two major civilian aircraft producers in the world, Airbus and Boeing. And they're debating technical debates about which one is getting a bigger government subsidy. Yeah. I mean, Airbus gets it directly, the United States gets it through uh, uh, the Air Force mm -hmm. and aerospace and so on. And, but they're kind of offshoots of the state sector. So, so historically, you are telling us that, in fact, uh, the, the centrality of the state has been concealed, but in or self-concealed in a way. Self-concealed. I mean, if, if you brought it forth, it would undercut the argument that we have to cut benefits yeah. for people. But precisely in the current situation, in a way, the, 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 the whole of the state is really uh, in, in plain sight. So, w because, you know... Well, right now it so happens to be in plain So what does it mean and what does it tell and us? And it's different because now it happens to be in the financial institutions. Yes. And the last 30 years or so, the financial institutions have followed pretty much of a market system. Mm -hmm. And the results were predictable, and in fact predicted mm -hmm. repeated deeper crises, uh, 
uh, huge bailouts and so on. That's the way market systems work. Mm -hmm. But even in the financial sector, which is to some extent approximating a market, the government's intervened crucially. Yes. I, mean, I mean, take the too big to fail policy. Yes. That's a government insurance policy. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, it and it gives perverse incentives. It encourages um, Citigroup and others to uh, uh, take huge risks because yes. if they get into trouble, the population will bail them out. What would have been your choice regarding uh, the bailout of the bank? Do you think that we should have left uh, this bank uh, go down the drain, or do you think that we should have, as it has been the case, help them and and, and bail them out? There, there are other possibilities. Like w what uh, I mean, would have been other possibilities? Know, forget what I would like. I'd like yes. to see. The, the workforce and the community take them over. But mm -hmm. in the existing system, a possibility would be for the government just to buy them. Mm -hmm. So to buy Citigroup uh, would cost a fraction of what it costs to bail it out. Yes. And, uh, and then, you know, if they didn't want to run it themselves, after mm -hmm. they can fix it up, they could give it away to somebody. Mm -hmm. But that would interfere with, the, with managerial prerogatives. In fact, if you look right now, mm -hmm. uh, Wall Street is exultant. Yes. Because the the whole system is being reconstituted, with almost no modifications, yes. uh, and uh, um, you know, they, I mean, a couple of days ago they allowed uh, a dozen or so banks to return the TARP money. Mm -hmm. um, that's supposed to get them to start lend to give money back to yes. the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you look at the footnotes, it also cuts back their lending, yeah. and that was the point of the TARP yeah. stimulus. And you know, they quote. Wall Street. Yeah. How do you explain that we that we let these bank uh, these banks becoming uh, too big to fail, becoming a systemic risk, uh, and and what does it tell us about the relationship between the financial sector and the political sector? In a way, in order for for an institution to become a systemic risk, uh, in order for this to be legitimate, this institution would have to deliver a systemic service. So, well, well where is the systemic service? Well, let's go back to the decision. Yes. Who made the decision? Mm -hmm. uh, the decision was made by a political system which is extensively dominated by the financial sector. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Adam, Adam Smith had the right comment about this. Uh, we're supposed to worship him, but not read him, but he had interesting things to say. Mm -hmm. uh, in, if you look at Wealth of Nations, he He's discussing England, of course. He says, in England, uh, the principal architects of policy, who are merchants and manufacturers, uh, make sure that their own interests are very peculiarly attended to, taken care mm -hmm. of, however grievous the impact on others. And that's perfectly natural. What you expect them to do? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, today the principal architects aren't merchants and manufacturers. They're financial institutions um, uh, who gave uh, most of the funding for the, for the last election to, and so on. So yeah, they've made the decisions. I mean, this began, there was a shift in the 70s. Uh, the first period after the Second World War was um, so-called Bretton Woods systems uh, uh, designed by uh, K, uh, John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White, mm -hmm. U.S. and Britain. And it was based, among other things, on uh, uh, regulation of capital. Uh, so state governments could stop capital export if they wanted. Uh, currencies were more or less regulated. Mm -hmm. And uh, Keynes and White uh, anticipated that this would lead to rapid growth. And it did, rapid and quite egalitarian growth. They also recognized that this would leave an opening to governments to carry out social democratic programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you financialize the economy, as happened in the 70s, and huge speculative flows and uh, tax on currencies and so on, it creates what uh, economists call a dual constituency for mm -hmm. governments. They've got the voters, they've got the financial sector, international financial sector. And the way they vote is if they don't like a government policy, mm -hmm. they vote against it by destroying the economy, yes. by capital flight, by tax mm -hmm. on currencies and so on. And in a competition, they win. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, but but uh, why is it that I mean, uh, uh, the, the the sense of outrage I I is not greater than what it is? I mean, why it is, is it that we have more or less accepted the fact that it's okay for these for these uh, entities to really uh, socialize losses and and privatize gains? Well, why is it that we are that's always been happening? I mean, the high tech economy like computers, the internet, and so on, biotechnology. It's based on the principle 
extensively, you know, 100 percent, but that the public pays the costs and takes the risks, and eventually, which can be after decades, profit is privatized. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, computers, for example, were, they were being developed in the lab where I work back yeah. in the 50s. They were completely unmarketable, huge monsters. Uh, when they finally got the most well, under Pentagon contracts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, IBM was in there learning how to shift from punch cards to uh, electronic computers and so on. I mean, finally, in the 60s, IBM was able to actually manufacture a computer, but mm -hmm. it was too expensive. It couldn't sell it to anyone. Yeah. So it was uh, the government, uh, the National Security Agency took it. It wasn't really until about 1980 that they started making profit mm -hmm. out of these things. The internet was in the public sector for 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, and it runs through the rest of the economy. So what's being done with the financial institutions, public pays the costs and gets mm -hmm. profits privatized, yes, that's the way the system works. So it's nothing new in a way? Not fundamentally new. So, but wh where is the, uh, the issue of accountability, the issue of responsibility in all of these uh, pathologies which are being generated? Well, first you know, first of all, um, who's supposed to be accountable? Mm -hmm. I mean, the people who make Adam Smith's observation is correct. The principal architects of policy are, they would only be accountable to an organized, active public. Mm -hmm. But in our modern democratic system, the public has been essentially atomized and marginalized. Yes. And again, that's not by accident. This is quite purposeful. Uh, uh, if you look at public opinion, I mean, it, it is outraged. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the United States, uh, about a year ago, I haven't seen polls since, about 80% of the public uh, felt that the government is being run, I'm quoting now, by a few big interests looking out for themselves, mm -hmm. not for the public. But they don't think they can do anything about it. Uh, they don't see any way out. I mean, the political parties are more or less the same, different yes. factions of the business party. Uh, uh, elections are essentially bought, uh, and the public is disorganized. Uh, it's but it's a very sad situation. Well, you know, it's a, I think it's a serious democratic deficit yes. uh, and a fundamental one. And, and, and it's one at the, at the uh, national level in the U.S., but also at the global no, level, global. because it's there global. is an issue of accountability and responsibility at the global level. How do you somehow make people accountable for this mistake yeah, yeah, at the global level? I mean, there are some interesting exceptions. Uh, for example, in, in my view, at least the most democratic country in the Western Hemisphere, maybe the world, is the poorest country in South America. Mm -hmm. Bolivia. Bolivia. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Bolivia, the, uh, the majority of the population, which is the most repressed population in the hemisphere, indigenous people, uh, they got together, they got organized, they've been very active for years, they've uh, constant struggle, you know, control resources. Uh, uh, finally, they entered the political arena. And they, entered, they elected someone from their own ranks mm -hmm. on serious issues, which they knew about. Mm -hmm. You know, not uh, his body language or his image or his, you know, soaring rhetoric or something, but uh, real issues uh, mm -hmm. like uh, cultural rights, which are very important, uh, just questions of justice, control over resources. I mean, that's a kind of a model of what democracy ought to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are cases where it's true in our own history. That's why you have progress. What about the role of, of media in democracy? I mean, it seems to me that to some extent, I mean, one has the impression that uh, uh, media has traded access for integrity. Because when you look at uh, channels dealing with uh, business and economics uh, in America, for instance, you know, you, you don't get the sense that uh, clarity is offered to you, uh, understanding is offered to you. So, and, and, and there is... That's uh, sort of predictable, too, on pretty elementary principles, more or less guided free market principles. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are the media? Well, first of all, they're huge corporations, uh, parts of even larger conglomerates. Uh, secondly, they rely for their income on other businesses, on advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not on, if you turn on the television set, they don't make any money, but they make it from yeah. advertising. Uh, and they're very closely linked to the state. They're linked to the tightly interlinked state corporate sector. And then there's another point, which has to do with uh, intellectual classes throughout history. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, is, there are rewards for conformity. Mm -hmm. There are punishments for dissidents. They vary depending on the nature yes. of the society. So in some societies, you get your head cut off or sent to the gulag mm -hmm. or something. Uh, in other Western societies, kind of more mild punishments. Yes. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they're there. And that creates a pretty natural tendency to conform. Mm -hmm. 
uh, to do the easy thing. So, for example, if I wanted to write an article, say, about uh, you know, Iranian support for terror, yes. I wouldn't even need a reference or a mm -hmm. footnote. I'd just write it. Yes. I, I could do it right now, no research. Everybody would cheer. Mm -hmm. Suppose I want to write an article about U.S. support for terror. Mm -hmm. Well, then you have to have documentation that meets the standards of physics. You know, you mm -hmm. get bitterly denounced and so on. Well, you know, if you have, ch if uh, say a young academic or reporter w makes a choice, there's a strong tendency to do the first, mm -hmm. and so over and of course you get rewarded for it. So the the the, the 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 structure of knowledge, the structure of information, the production of knowledge, the production of information somehow echoes the demands of power. And that's true in every society that yes. I know of as far back as you go in history. Yes. I mean, say, take classical Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, the man who drank the hemlock mm -hmm. was the one who was corrupting the youth of Athens and uh, uh, you know, encouraging to worship false gods, uh, not the one who mm -hmm. was uh, you know, supporting power. Or take, say, the, the Hebrew Bible, the mm -hmm. Old Testament. I mean, they, they had a category of people who by our, we would call intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who were uh, criticizing the king, uh, the evil king, giving geopolitical analysis, uh, calling for uh, mercy to widows and orphans and so on. They're called prophets, although it's a bad translation mm -hmm. of an obscure word. Were they treated nicely? Oh, they're yeah. in prison, mm -hmm. they're driven into the desert and so on. There were also uh, uh, people who centuries later were called false prophets. Mm -hmm. They were the flatterers of the court and mm -hmm. they did fine. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's the model throughout history, and it's understandable. But I mean, turning to the future, then the question is, I mean, how do you manage so that you have somehow power at the service of democratic ideals, democratic values, well, and, and not the other way around? It's happened. I mean, it takes age, the United States, in many ways, the freest country in the world. Mm -hmm. it, uh, the country was founded on the principle that, I'm quoting James Madison, uh, the main framer, that power should be in the hands of the wealth of the nation, the most responsible set of men, of those who have sympathy for property owners and their rights. That's why the Senate is established mm -hmm. as the most powerful component of the state system. It's shifted over the years, but that's the way it was at the time. Mm -hmm. The least accountable to the public, uh, wealthy men, and the most powerful. And uh, uh, he, for him, the said straight out the goal of the one major goal of the government is to protect the minority of the opulent from the majority mm -hmm. and it was set up that way well you know over the centuries there's been a lot of struggle over that mm -hmm. and power has to a not trivial extent devolved yes. so in the 1920s uh, women were allowed to vote mm -hmm. uh, technically blacks were allowed to vote in the 1860s but it was a hundred years before mm -hmm. it was even formally allowed and, and it still is so not the case. So in a sense you're saying two things. First of all, you are quite optimistic. Yeah. You are saying that over time things, things evolve and in a positive fashion. And over second time. of all, but it's always a struggle. It's always a struggle and the progress comes through struggle. Mm -hmm. um, the things that we do have plenty of privilege and freedom, but it was it's not given as a gift from above. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's won by struggle from but, but, you know, Going back to the economic crisis, going back to what it means for developing countries, I mean, you know, how do you make your case as a poor country, as a, as a, as a developing country, uh, you know, just to, to, to make sure that your fate is not really forgotten in the management of this crisis? In other words, if you are powerless, how do you make your case? How do you really well, give yourself a, a, a quiet voice? Take, say, Latin America again. Yes. In many ways, the most exciting place in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, ever since the Spanish and Portuguese conquests, mm -hmm. uh, Latin America has been, first of all, the countries have been divided from one another, so mm -hmm. very little integration. But they've also been sharply split internally mm -hmm. with a very wealthy, dominant sector and a huge mass of poverty. Well, in the last uh, decade or two, that's been changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the countries are, f for the first time in 500 years, beginning to integrate to some extent. There are a uh, union of South American republics, the Bank of the South, other things. They're beginning a process of integration, mm -hmm. which is a prerequisite for independence. You don't get picked off one by one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they're also beginning, at least, to face some of the severe internal problems 
I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of striking that Latin America is, didn't develop the way East Asia did. Yes. It's got many more natural advantages, mm -hmm. internal resources and so on. But roughly speaking, the wealthy in Latin America just didn't have responsibilities. Yeah, absolutely. They uh, sent their capital off to Zurich or London, mm -hmm. uh, second home in the Riviera, you know, and so absolutely. on and so forth. Uh, in East Asia, they were controlled. And they, very often they don't identify with their own people. No, they don't care about their own people. Absolutely. But in, in um, East Asia, it was different. Yeah. For example, in, East, in South Korea, during its development, mm -hmm. big development process, uh, they banned capital export. In fact, you could get the death penalty for it. Mm -hmm. Now, you go to Latin America, you know, capital exports comparable so to the dead. So, so here, in fact, you are pinpointing the issue of leadership. I mean, well, you know... it's not just leadership. Take South Korea again. Mm -hmm. A lot of this was done under a dictatorial yes. regime. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in the 1980s, there was a very inspiring democracy struggle, mm -hmm. which threw out the dictator and introduced significant democratic reforms. So, uh, but the elites cared for their country. So what does it take for elites to they care? They were forced to care yes. for their country. So, but you know, uh, there's also cultural differences. Yes, but you know, th th because in the end, if leaders are not really you know, committed to their country, it's going to be very difficult for this country to go yes. ahead. So but what does it take for for for, for well political elites, for economic elites, to really be committed to the welfare of their nation? It takes pressure from usu almost always from below. So to to constrain mm -hmm. the predatory character of state capitalist systems mm -hmm. takes public pressure. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what the New Deal was. That's take the United States, yeah. the New Deal, the Great Society, and so on. They came from the, a mass public pressure. Yeah. But uh, at the global level, how do you, where do you find this pressure? How do you create it to precisely have, uh, once again, the, 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 the needs, the interests of the poor countries being uh, 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 taken into account. Well, Where do you find it? How do you create it? If, if you're speaking on the international sphere, yes. it has to be integration among countries. Mm -hmm. So for well, take say Latin America again, because it's an interesting case. Uh, the traditional elites in Bolivia mm -hmm. uh, don't like what's happening. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who owned and ran the country, and they don't want it to be democratized. And they're starting a kind of an autonomy movement to sort of separate themselves from the country. And it was, became pretty violent last September. Yes. Well, the, there was a meeting of the Union, UNASUR, the Union of South American Republics, all of them, mm -hmm. uh, in Santiago, Chile, which uh, dealt with this internal crisis in Bolivia. They came out with a pretty strong statement supporting the president, Morales. Mm -hmm. And in response, he uh, made an interesting statement. He said that, thank them for the support, and he said, uh, this is the first time since the European conquest, that Latin America has taken its fate into its own hand mm -hmm. without the interference of foreign powers. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, that's been mostly the United States. Well, he was basically correct. Mm -hmm. Now, th that's what the United Nations ought to be. Yes. And one reason why the General Assembly is marginalized is because it does, to some extent at least, reflect yes. uh, the international public, you know, not totally, or take, say, G77, yes. which is now, I think, about 130. Uh, their sta their, uh, that's most of the states in the world, but their positions aren't even reported. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do we change the state of affairs? I mean, how do we, once again, create pressure for having uh, powerful countries, understanding that it is also uh, in their interest to really uh, be much more inclusive and uh, seek uh, uh, integration uh, wide and, and deep? There's no magic keys. Mm -hmm. It just takes education and organizing. Mm -hmm. uh, on the international level, uh, take, say, the World Social Forum. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, uh, usually January, there's two meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, one in Davos of the world rulers and owners, uh, another the World Social Forum somewhere mm -hmm. in the south, always meets in the south, mm -hmm. uh, mostly. And uh, the one in Davos is called pro-globalization, yes. and the one in say, uh, you know, Brazil. Puerto Alegre is yeah. called anti-globalization, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting, it's, it's, it's an interesting indication of how power controls terminology. Because yes. in fact, it's the World Social Forum which is in favor of globalization. Mm -hmm. It brings together, it's a model of globalization, it brings together people from all over the world, all 
the work, work, walks of life, mm -hmm. uh, peasants, uh, workers, uh, professionals, human rights activists, mm -hmm. and so on, you know, 100,000 all over, and they work out uh, pretty concrete social programs mm -hmm. about what ought to happen, but that's called anti-globalization mm -hmm. because they're interested in globalization in the interests of people. Mm -hmm. When you go to Davos, it's called globalization because they're interested in economic integration in mm -hmm. the interests of uh, uh, powerful sectors, mm -hmm. investors, and so on. But the way to do it is by taking structures like the World Social Forum and its many offshoots so in fact, the United Nations and make them work. You are not against globalization, you are in favor of a civilized form of globalization, yeah, a, fo a form globalization. of global integration. I mean, perfectly. You know, when I go to Puerto Alegre, I'm favoring globalization. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not the kind that the powerful yeah, call global. Absolutely. Jürgen Habermas, the German philosopher, talks about uh, the idea of world domestic policy, the, the idea of precisely in order to have these norms existing at the global level being taken seriously, in order to have reality matching them, he's talking about the idea of having a sense of public policy somehow becoming global. Do you think uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting idea or not? Uh, it's an interesting idea, but the question is how it's done. Yes. Are you going to do it the Davos way, or are you going to do it the Porto Alegre? Well, of course, we want yeah. it to be the Porto Alegre okay, way. And, that's so, what and that so that precisely, within the context of the UN, within the context of the upcoming the conference the on the... upcoming conference could so be a forum in which uh, globalization in the interests of people is uh, pressed forward. Mm -hmm. But if it is, it won't be reported, mm -hmm. or it'll be ridiculed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the consequence of... Uh, speaking for mm -hmm. the public and not for the wealthy. Yeah, and but how do you, once again, I always go back to the same question, how do you make sure that uh, government states do not hijack the uh, character and the interest of, interest of government of people? states? And how do you truly put them at the service of people? Well, that's what popular struggle has yes. been about. Mm -hmm. now, that's why the United States, for example, today is not constructed on the Madisonian model. Mm -hmm. Totally, partially it is, but not totally. It's a constant battle. And there's regression and there's progress, but I think over time the tendency is towards progress. Mm -hmm. Slow, difficult. I mean, I mean, take again the United States. Uh, take the last election. Mm -hmm. Personally, I, I didn't like any of the candidates. Yes. However, it's quite striking that the Democrats had an African American and a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, Forty years ago, that would have been absolutely unthinkable. Mm -hmm. In fact, twenty years ago it would have been unthinkable. Now, why is it happening? Well, that's a long-term effect of the activism of the 1960s, mm -hmm. especially among young people, which is bitterly denigrated. But if you think about it, it had a big civilizing effect on the country. Mm -hmm. It broke down barriers on women's rights, on civil rights, and environmental concerns, uh, opposition to aggression. Mm -hmm. It just civilized the country slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, so and that's why it's denounced. Yeah, no, absolutely. But based on this precisely, what would be possible in, te in, in 20 years from now which is not possible today. Well, let's not take a concrete example. What do you envision take, for the take future? Take one concrete example, yes. mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of surreal in a way. I mean, right now, the government, and this is a liberal democratic government, is effectively dismantling the auto industry mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time has a stimulus mm -hmm. package uh, which has funds in it for uh, doing something to alleviate the environmental crisis, like high-speed mm -hmm. trains. Yeah. Well, how are they proceeding? The Wall Street Journal had an article a couple of days ago. The transportation secretaries in Spain mm -hmm. trying to, and the Spanish are trying to get stimulus money so they can build high-speed rail and infrastructure for the United States. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we're dismantling the industrial structure that can do exactly that with its own high, highly skilled workers mm -hmm. and throwing them out of work. Because in a financialized economy, the welfare of the population doesn't matter. What matters is uh, how much profit can uh, Wall Street make. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, this is literally surreal. Mm -hmm. And what could be done is that the so-called stakeholders, the workforce in the mm -hmm. community, could just take over the industries, reconstruct them, they'd need some government aid, and turn them towards producing what the country and, in fact, the world needs, mm -hmm. efficient high-speed trans transport. Well, you know, that's not in people's heads, mm -hmm. but it's not far below. It's been tried a few mm -hmm. times, and maybe in 20 years it will be in people's heads.
-hmm. Professor Shumsky, thank you for, for your time. I, don't, I, I know that you have to be yeah. uh, up town uh, later on, so I don't want to keep you yeah. too long. I really thank you for having taken the time to be with us uh, today. I am Jean-Marc Quaco from the United Nations University. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you really.